to Women's Conference to come and join me on the stage. And if you were able to go to Women's Conference, if you were a lady or a girl, I want you to come on down. <laughs> I talked to the ladies on the way home and I just, I, I wanted to, uh, them to share uh, just what was a highlight for this weekend um, or something that you learned, you take away, um, something that the Lord ministered to you. And I think for me, I will go ahead and start. It was like the Lord was speaking to us um, and it was all on the same topic and he just, he spoke about, you know, not being busy and, and um, you know, being missional minded, going and making disciples wherever you go. And I mean, there was just so much that I got, but I felt like God was just speaking to us um, all on the same topic and I was totally blessed. So, all right, Zita. I guess one of the things that I took away is to um, just be more in his presence more often. Um, I do my devotions every morning, you know, in 15 or 20 minutes, but then a lot of times throughout the day I don't always listen to him, listen to him. So um, that's the main thing is just to always be in his presence and seek his advice in everything you do. What got me was the 10 signs of hurry sickness. When we try to do more and more in less amount of time. Um, the 10 signs of hurry was irritability, hypersensitivity, restlessness, compulsive overworking, emotional numbness, disconnected, human needs, hoarding energy, spiritual slippage. And how do we break it? Read scripture, worship, fellowship, Okay, Sarah, can you um, tell what you were able to receive? Show? Okay, she won a basket, and this shirt was in it. The God of Suddenly, and it is, I, I don't know if this was from the, oh yeah, Impact Student Ministries from the Youth Ministry. One thing that I learned from uh, from ladies conference is uh, there was a girls class and it was teaching about identity and uh, being able to understand who you are and who you're the child of. Awesome. Okay, what do I say? Um, God just moved in such a, a miraculous way yesterday afternoon. Um, the, way, the way he ministered and, and blessed and encouraged our, at one point, the worship team was uh, leading us all in worship, and the next moment, God had just let loose on that platform. And Sister Stephanie started letting God just minister to her, and the next thing you know, the whole worship team was allowing God to move, and the whole service just took a new turn. And in that, he reminded me that I need to take more time, that we all need to step back and think about what we do at all times. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing, to be worshiping at all times, and to be full of his joy. And we often, you get so caught up in life and you forget about the things that you need to do. And he reminded me that regardless of where my husband stands upon the word, I need to make sure that I'm putting him first after God in my life. And that I need to be more attentive to him and his needs, not just my family. And so I'm gonna work really hard 
and to making sure that I'm spending my loving times and giving him the, the attention that he needs. All right, thank you ladies, you may be seated. Um, it was worth it and if you weren't able to go, um, I would highly encourage you to maybe next year um, be able to go with us. It was, it was a great time of encouragement and um, just the goodness of God. So. I just want to pray a blessing over the service. God, I thank you. Lord, you are here. But we welcome your presence and we open our hearts right now to receive from you what you have for us. Lord, in this day, in this moment, in this time, God, I pray that we would receive from you and we would be able to give to you our best worship. Lord, we pray, Lord, that we would come boldly to the throne of grace today. Lord, we just love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. I just wanted to have a quick word with my church family. Um, I'm just, I just appreciate all of you and how you've uh, encouraged me and brought me through. Um, you prob I probably heard by now that Daryl went home to be with the Lord on Friday on my birthday. <laughs> and uh, he just, it was so peaceful and it was sweet. But we had to let him go. And um, I just appreciate all your prayers. Um, and I know he did too. He knew that you were praying for him. And I have a verse. I have a verse. Again, truly, I tell you that if two or three are gathered together on the earth, um, asking for anything, it will be done for, for them by my Father in heaven. Matthew 18 and 19. And uh, I feel like that's how we have to be. We, we, we pray for each other. We care about each other. We need each other. And we have our own family, yes, but our church family is important to us. And uh, I appreciate all you guys have done for us. And, and uh, I know that you're going to be there with me as I go on. And uh, my daughter came home from Iowa, my youngest daughter, Becca. And she uh, surprised me. In the day after Daryl passed, and uh, I just was so happy to have her here. And Sarah will be home in the middle of the week, and we'll have our our time together in fellowship here for Daryl's funeral. But uh, we're just we're just thankful. We're just so thankful that he got to to meet the Lord and be out of pain. And it's um, it's hard to let him go, but it's the way it. That's the way life is, isn't it? You know, we just, we thank the Lord. And uh, we praise Him. We praise Him every day. Oh. Well, we have everybody stand. We're going to stand and, and we're just going to pray over the family. Father, Lord, we just thank you for who you are, what you are. And you're, you, we thank you for your sweet presence, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that the, the time that we were there with Daryl, Lord, we could feel your your spirit, Lord, and, and, and your peace, Lord, around him. Father, we thank you for that. Lord, but we know, Lord, that in our hearts, Lord, we still hurt. The family still hurts. Daryl was a great husband, a great dad, grandfather, a friend, a member here at the tabernacle, a loyal member. A man who loved you with all of his heart and served you. But Lord, right now, Lord, we're praying for the family. Lord, give them peace, comfort, joy. Joy above and beyond what our natural minds could ever expect or even understand. Father, we thank you, Lord. We pray, Lord, that when, when we have the service, Lord, that it is a time of celebration. 
a celebration of life, Lord, who is with you. Lord, rejoice, rejoice at the throne. Father, we give you praise, we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. stand with us that would be awesome give somebody a high five a fist bump a handshake a hello we welcome our newest newest little guy isaiah today he's with us we want to welcome them Welcome our snowbirds, some more of our snowbirds, Chad and Kathleen. Welcome you guys. Amen. Amen. Our missionaries today, Anna and Ryan. Make sure you say hi. Hi. <laughs> Ready for that day. <laughs> Amen. 
Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. All the people said amen. Amen. TFM. So yes. Amen. God is good. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Even when things are, are rough, God is still good. Amen. Amen. Even when we go through tough times, God is still good. Amen. Our, our theme for the year, expect more in 24. So we expect more. Praise you, Jesus. Just a couple of announcements. Um, next weekend, next Saturday, 9 a.m., church work days. This coming up Saturday, so six days. Gloves, rakes, strong backs, wheelbarrows. Young men, old men, young ladies, old ladies. Listen, when we had the Easter egg hunt for the adults, you guys picked up 500 eggs in 30 seconds. So. We're going to be putting mulch. We're going to have mulch all in bags all the way around the church so that it has to be opened and sp spread out, um, picking up sticks, everything ready for the spring. So we need all hands on deck. So please be there, 9 a.m. Lunch will be provided. Um, we need everyone to be there that can be there. And then next Sunday, next Sunday after, uh, are we doing it after or before? 
before service. Class? Yeah, at, was it after class? After. Right after class, yes. I should know that because I'm teaching it. So, right after class, baptismal class. So anybody who wants to be baptized, and we're going to be doing that on the May 5th. So anybody that wants to be baptized, you need to be here at this class. It's, it's not going to last long, in about an hour at the most, and then we'll be able to do that. We want to, um, so yes, you can register online, let me know, or whatever, but we really need to know how many are going to be there, so we know how many will be here for the baptismal. Um, um, well, we'll see. We're, yeah, we're, we're going to do the baptismal right here. Right there. Vern, can you fit in it? <laughs> so, yes. So please, um, we want you to be a part of that. The first women's meeting that we, have, uh, we haven't had in a while will be May 16th. Um, that's on a Thursday night at 5 o'clock in the family room. Um, and then remember, camp, man, can you believe camp's coming already this fast? But camp sign up is um, the last two weeks of May, the, the 19th and the 26th. So pre-register before June 1st. And then Addison, go to the, um, the golf outing up there. Two-man scramble, 18 holes in Breckenridge at the Ridge. $100 per team. Um, this is for our food pantry. Um, all um, um, proceeds and everything are going to go towards the food pantry. Um, so please, um, let's, let's fill it up. I think they said we could have 36 teams. So we want to be able to do that. So, yes, you and one other person. That's all it takes, a two-person team. I think that's it. Who's ready to bring our tithes and our offerings, amen? We'll have you go ahead and bring those up, and then we will pray and we will bless them when we're done. Every time that you play, proved it in the life you gave. More powerful than any grave, forever worthy and deserving of it all. We sing, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Holy Messiah. We sing, Emmanuel, God with us, Prince of Peace. Oh, we praise, Lamb of God, Deliverer, Risen Savior. We cry. Let's pray. Father, you're such an amazing God. Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for the ability to give back to you what you've given to us. Lord, you say bring our first fruit, so Lord, we bring you our very best. Lord, bless it and multiply it. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for every, every need. Lord, is, you supply all of our needs according to your riches and your glory. Lord, and we thank you for that. So Lord, we give this back to you. Use it, Lord, for whatever way you choose. Lord, people, missionaries, um, Families, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that it is, there's always enough in the storehouse, Lord. Because, Lord, we're a church that believes in giving back to you what you've given to us. So we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Would you stand?
into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There is no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God.
Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. your regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. What a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of for each one of us. Lord, but you didn't just die. Lord, you, you, you went to hell, Lord, and you defeated the grave. Lord, you had victory over Satan and all of his demons, Lord. Lord, you took the keys to eternity, Lord, and now you sit at the right hand of the Father. Father, we praise you for that. Lord, we thank you. Lord, that someday, someday, Lord, the eastern skies will open. The trumpet will sound. Lord, and we'll all be there. And just a blink of an eye, Father, we thank you for that. We praise you. Praise you for the gift. 
Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we come to you, Lord, and we, we bring our prayer request before you. Is there anybody here this morning with an unspoken prayer request? Go ahead and lift up your hands. Lord, we come into agreement, Lord, with every hand that was raised today, Jesus. We come into agreement, Lord, that you're a healer, Lord, that you're a savior. Lord, you're a God that provides all of our needs, Lord. And, and Lord, it doesn't matter what the need is, Lord. You're a God who is there saying, yes, you are my sons, you are my daughters. The answer is yes. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that for the blessings and the healings, Lord, and, and the bills being paid, Lord, and, and, and a new house or a new car, Lord, whatever we're the need of, Lord, you're saying yes. Lord, if it's, if it's a heart that needs to be healed, lungs or a knee or an ankle or a back, Lord, you're saying yes, Lord. So we stand upon your word, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, that it is done. It is done. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you answer all of our prayers. Lord, once again, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for the Quisenberries. Lord, bring their family peace and love, joy and joy. Lord, we pray for Ted right now, Lord, as he had surgery on his eye, Lord, and, and, and the polyp, Lord, is out, Lord, and, and, and the report come back, Lord, no cancer. So, Lord, we thank you for that, Lord, but he still needs um, the, the rest of the healing, Lord, the swelling to go down. And, and Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, that it is being done right now. Lord, we pray for Rex, Lord, continually heal Rex's body. Lord, any um, Sister Vivian went home, she wasn't feeling well, and, and Bev, Lord, we just pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, Lord, that you... You touch these people, Lord, who are not feeling well. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Kids Church, 5 to 10, is dismissed. You can find... Follow Miss Brittany over here. You're older than five. <laughs> Bill, you can't go. <laughs> Amen. Is it hot in here? Maybe it's me. I'm just, ooh, it's hot. Ask the drummer. Is it hot? It's hot. I thought so, too. All right, without further ado, we have some special guests with us today. We have missionaries. Let's give our missionaries a great hand. Come on, make your way up here. Ryan and Anna, you guys, we, I'm going to let the, you guys tell who you are, what you're about. We're turning it over to you. You guys are going to do an amazing job. And we thank God for you. We pray blessings over you. And we love you guys and thank you for being here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is so good to be with you before my wife goes on and on about all the things that we do. I am so honored that we had the opportunity to meet your pastors a couple of weeks ago in person and have a few conversations. They were one of the few people that came up to us looking for us to greet us hug us and say, let me tell you everything about us. We cannot wait to meet you. Oh my goodness. So feeling that love and appreciation and just joy, it was such a blessing and we've been looking forward to this week. In fact, uh, I've heard so many good things about this church and this community, but it's probably because of the friends that I roll with here. Uh, that said, I am so thankful that we get to be here this morning. Before Ryan has a word to share with you guys, I wanted to take a couple of minutes and explain exactly what we are missionaries to. Because we do not have a traditional field, and so I always find it helpful to be able to talk about it just to let you guys know what we do um, in missions. So about five years ago, uh, four to five years ago, the Pentecostal Church of God started a new department called Global Education. Now this is inside of Global Missions, and the purpose was to train new missionaries and to create curriculum and biblical education overseas in a lot of our churches that were needing information. They were needing biblical curriculum, but they just didn't have a way to get it. And so with that, 
Ryan and I came on as missionaries. And the reason we take that title, um, it's not just because we work in the missions department, um, it's because the entire department, because it's new and everything that we do is donor funded. Um, so we travel and we visit churches to let you guys know exactly what is going on, um, the projects that we're doing. We focus on two specific areas and I will let you all know that we are very, very passionate about these things and we have a table up there if you guys want to come talk to us about anything. We love talking about it. However, the two areas that we focus on is we focus on missionary training inside the states. We believe that there is a generation of missionaries that are going to be on the field, um, that God has placed in their hearts specifically a country or specifically a region or a people group that God has placed in their heart for them to be able to minister to. And God has given us a passion to make sure that they are prepared for that mission whenever God sends them. And so we have a missionary training program called Missionary Development Path that we run every single year. We get them um, educated and then practical application on the field. So we actually take them to different countries and have them do the ministry while we sit back and kind of give feedback of, and help any way that we can to help them grow. And then the second area that we work in is uh, theological training, Bible training outside of the states. Now, this area is where we spend our other half of our time. And this just means that we write curriculum, Bible curriculum, and then we go and do training for pastors and different ministerial leaders in different countries. One example of this is that last year, we got the amazing opportunity to go to Uganda for five months and work with uh, pastors in refugee camps. And we did um, biblical training seminars with all these pastors. And the reason that we did that is because they're in the, um, what is the northern part, there's a South Sudanese refugee camps. And many pastors, as you might know, feel, felt called to the ministry, but they felt that call in the refugee camp. And so they were stuck there. They really had no way of gaining more funds than what they had. However, they were really passionate about their ministry and wanted to be able to minister well to the people that came to them because there was a lot of issues, very specific issues that they were dealing with. Suicides and depression were two of the major ones. And so they were asking if there was any missionaries or any training that they could get. And right at that time, we were in Uganda, and Ryan will talk a little bit about this in his message, how we ended up there. It's a very interesting story. Um, we happened to be there and we heard about this and we're like, yes, we would love to help. I already have the curriculum written. Tell us when and where. Um, and so these are a couple of things that we do. I just wanted to share that with you guys just so you know who we are and um, what our ministry is. Okay. Yeah, this is our first time itinerating, genuinely getting to go out into the districts and meet our connections. A few years ago, uh, I joined my wife in global education. In fact, she got the job nearly out of college. It was her dissertation that she presented, and Virgil Kincaid, the director of missions, was on that uh, board where he, she was giving her presentation. He's like, you know what, I really like what you're doing there. I think you got something. We want to bring you on. And a few years later, I got to come on and join her. And since this is our first time, we understand that this is something a little bit new whenever we have the question hey what field are you going to by the way education nobody understands that <laughs> nobody gets it and we understand that as well that said uh, it is one of our great joys that we actually get to go out into the districts and into the churches and make our connections because we haven't had the opportunity to do this for the past couple of years and it is such a joy meeting all of you if you have your bibles please turn to acts 17 and we'll be reading out of verse 22 through 28. For those who want a little bit of context, I'll be giving it as we continue. But this is Paul in Athens reading or addressing uh, his address to the Areopagus. And it says, So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. 
For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gave, gives all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. A couple of years ago, there was an opportunity in our missions department to go to an African country, and my wife and I were invited to take part in that program. We were going to be the, in, the initiative, the persons who were going to step into that country, break ground, and meet with co communities, churches, and pastors to bring them into the PCG. We had raised funds for seven months to go to South Africa and Botswana, and I mean nearly three weeks away from our time. We've already put someone in our apartment, we've given up our car, we have nothing left here except two tickets to paradise, which is paradise in this situation is Botswana, because that's where we're going. We get told that is no longer possible, and we have nothing but momentum. We cannot stop now. So because someone knew someone who knew someone who knew someone who, who also knew someone in Africa, they said, I can actually have a house there. Why don't you come up to Uganda, and we can actually host you for the time. And that became, I mean, it was I, two Zoom calls, and we were in a different country. And those weren't very long, extensive calls. We got very little information. Here's how much information we had. Did you know that if you Google, hey, what do they speak in Uganda? It will tell you they speak Swahili. You know what they don't speak in Uganda? They don't speak Swahili. So Google lied to me. I tried a Swahili phrase at customs, and they're like, it's fine. We speak English here. OK, well, that. That went about as well as I wanted it to go. No, I wanted to make a good first impression, and now we're coming in. It's Christmas Day. The streets are quiet. We're exhausted because the flights take forever to get there. And so after a few days of trying to find our new rhythm, our new way of life, we start our hour walk to the store now. This day in particular, we have decided we need to get a new phone, and we have to get some Wi-Fi so we can do proper work. It's a short walk, an hour, nothing like that. But I don't know if you know this or not. Two individuals that look like my wife and I stand out in Africa. And so people on the streets are like, hello, Mazungu. And they told me it means white person. And I hope it means white person. But everyone said it. And so we know that we stand out. So when we finally arrive at the store, I'm looking at inexpensive phones. My wife's trying to haggle at the counter. And a gentleman comes up to him come to my wife, leans on the counter and begins having a conversation. Best case scenario, this man's just trying to offer her a phone. Worst case scenario, I'm going to have to fight to get my wife back, and I don't have those kind of skills in my like, repertoire. And now, I get what you're thinking. How could you think that? I was set to go to South Africa. I know nothing about Uganda. So we're there, and at this perfect moment, I mean, it was like God orchestrated the whole thing, and we found out he did, another white woman walks in the store. So I think if I mosey over to my wife and stand next to her, he'll move on to the next woman and take her instead. And I'm thinking that's the best plan I can come up with on a short amount of time. Now that may not be good, but that said, I misjudged the entire situation, which is obvious. Because as I soon come find out, this gentleman's from America. He lives in Colorado, but he was born in Uganda. He was having a conversation with us because clearly we stand out in the culture. And he was inviting us to his orphanage. His orphanage was about an hour and a half away. It's called Father the Fatherless. Matthias had founded it, I believe, two to three years prior. 
he had bought the land and started serving not only the orphans in that community, but the surrounding villages. When we arrive on New Year's Eve, he takes us around the campus to not only see how much he's impacting the community, but he's showing us crop fields to feed the children, an orphanage that hosts the, the children, a school to teach them, a clinic to care for them, a church so that they can be raised correctly, a parsonage for any kind of guest to come and minister, and then another house just in case. They have a water filtration system. These people are caring for the surrounding areas so well that when he initially arrived, they were so aggressive to him. You're an American with money. You're just here to buy land. And now because he's caring for them, this man cares about us. And he had changed the atmosphere so much that people really loved and respected Matthias. So as he's taking us around this campus, he's showing us all of these buildings, the things that they're doing. And one of his proudest testaments, I mean the first thing that he wanted to show us, is please let me show you this tree stump. And he stared at it for a minute. And he said, this is a great testimony. Now, I've seen a tree stump before. It was big. So I was assuming there was a story. And it didn't take long before he said, there used to be a tree here. And it took everything in me not to be a smart aleck in a different culture. So I just inquired, really? And he said, yes, in fact, this used to be a god. See, in certain cultures, they still find nature, mountains, large pieces of trees, inanimate objects, and they worship them. They find something. The very rains that they bless down in Africa could be a god there. And this tree served the same purpose. In fact, people in those surrounding villages, when he bought that campus and knew he was a Christian, they were aggressive with him. When he planted a church in that same field, they, qu they questioned things. And however, as he began working and ministering to them, it changed their opinion of him. So when he had finally built trust with his communities, he told them, it's time for the tree god to come down. And what was fascinating about all of this is that they weren't angry when he said it to them. They were concerned. They said, you cannot do it because that god will kill you. I've already resolved the spirit will not let me keep that and the church here. That tree has to go, but I'll make you a deal. I'm cutting it down, and if I survive it, you have to come to church on Sunday. The day comes, the tree goes down, and I mean every day after the villagers come. Matthias, how are you feeling? What's going on with you? Was that a cough? Are you coughing now? What was that? And they begin questioning everything every day, and yet he's responding, I've never felt better. I've never felt lighter. In fact, since it's been gone, I've never slept better either. <laughs> Sunday comes, and now people see he's standing behind the pulpit. So yes, people found out that there was a God who was greater than the tree. And people gave their lives to Christ and still stands as a testament and a testimony to this day in that campus. All this to say, there are places in the world to this day that still have objects, idols, and altars for worship. And although I'm a teacher, I have enough of the charismatic movement in my background to know that if I want you to remember this, I have to make it rhyme. <laughs> so if you're taking notes today, my sermon is on the altars we find and the altars we leave behind. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here and that your presence is with us. God, as you minister and as you teach us, let us hear your words. Amen. When we get to this portion in Acts 17, the disciples have been scattered throughout the surrounding regions. They have gone from Jerusalem where they were to Judea and Samaria, the surrounding areas, and now they're reaching the ends of the earth. As the book of Acts has unfolded, we've inherited new individuals that will inspire the Christian faith. We've seen Stephen, Barnabas, and Paul, specifically who was crusader turned Christian turned convict. 
He's been ministering so much that when Luke is writing in Acts, he goes from in-depth storyteller to we went here, we did this, this happened. We went here, we did this, this happened. We went here, we did this, and repetitively goes on like that. Except for when we get to this portion in Acts, he takes time to be an in-depth storyteller again. Taking time out so that we understand. And because that stands differently to the surrounding text, it means that we have to pay attention. Paul is in Athens. By this point, he is speaking to such a diverse audience. In the temple, he's dealing with the questions that Jesus had to face. The ones that experienced rabbis would have to question even within themselves before they ever approached an audience. And people in the synagogues and temples are furious with him. In a couple of chapters, we'll see that he is snatched in Jerusalem and he will be tried because of some of the teaching, the dealings, even though they have to make up a scenario for him to be arrested in the first place. But in the surrounding area, the other aspect that he's inherited, he is now teaching in the marketplace to the individuals who are considered ignorant of what's true. Ignorant meaning they were just susceptible to their culture, their philosophy, the thing that they were being taught around, not aware of what was truly happening in the temples or who Jesus was. And so Je Paul has now inherited them as a cause as well, I will teach them. If you know Zeus or Athena or Hermes, Paul and Barnabas have already been mistaken for these Greek gods a few chapters prior in chapter 14. In fact, to prove their own humanity, they will rip their cloaks off and show how human they are, and I'm just grateful that we live in a time where we don't have to do that. <laughs> this is where we find Paul in Acts 17. Paul and Silas were ministering in Thessalonica and Berea, and when the Jews in the area saw their works taking effect, they began stirring the crowds. So Silas and Timothy have to send Paul up ahead because this story ends with him either stoned or beaten or cut or worse. Let's not forget what Paul represents at this point. Peter and John, they were uneducated fishermen, but Saul, he was a studied student who played the role of executioner. And now in one encounter with Jesus, this man is now the greatest testimony in the region. To the Jew, Paul is just as destructive to Judaism as Lazarus. And for those who do not know or may not be aware, everyone knows Lazarus for getting out of the grave four days later. Ladies, I'm sure you just heard about that. But because he was alive, breathing, walking, and talking, it says in John 12, the leaders in that area set up plans to kill Lazarus again because he was the reason many were believing Jesus. And now we find Paul doing the same in Jesus' name. To the Pharisee leader, Jesus is this invasive virus to the law and doctrine. He is a plague on the word of God, and they have successfully killed him, and that was not enough. Now we're dealing with the likes of his disciples, spreading the message from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and everywhere else, and Paul, one of the best and brightest for the Jewish cause, has now turned follower of Christ. You have to know they want this man dead. And so he's sent to Athens. For those who haven't read this portion of scripture before, I want us to go back. It says in Acts 17 and verse 15, those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. That right there gives us so much understanding. Paul is alone. There is no community, no partner or partnership. There's no one with him in this situation. And so Paul waits. And while he waits, it says in verse 16, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue to the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Paul's spirit is provoked. In the waiting, he's unable to sit quietly with his head low until others come. Why? Because the very work that has had him stoned and beaten 
The same work that has almost cost him his life on numerous occasions. The same work that has a bounty on his head, dead or alive, he cannot wait because he's being provoked again. Paul is working with ministers and in the marketplace. And the first question I want us to reason is this. What will our response be when God puts us in a place where there are no believers? When your closest people are still not there yet and you have a prompting in your spirit to speak. That you're speaking truth to the religiously ignorant. That you're speaking truth to the individuals in the marketplace. That you're speaking truth, not because you want to, but because you're speaking out of what you're being provoked to speak to or against. That you cannot sit quietly anymore. What is your response when the Spirit provokes you? When you're the only one in a foreign land or just down the street, how will you respond when there's an altar in front of you that needs a name? Will you sit quietly waiting for backup or will you step out in boldness knowing that God is all the company that you need? Amen. The story continues to find something like that of an altar. Paul's taken note of this popular idol and now sees an opportunity to speak to the Aeropagus. He references it back to where we started in verse 22. It reads, so Paul standing in the midst of the Aeropagus said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For a moment, it's interesting that Paul opens with an acknowledgement of their spirituality. He opens with an understanding of their culture. And from what he has seen, you indeed are very religious. They've made this no secret. Athens itself is named after a Greek goddess, Athena. Scriptures are built to the testament of man throughout the city, and gods are continually found and discovered and built to idolize and immortalize. However, these idols of worship are not worthy but feared. The gods depicted are either selfishly working towards their own gain or must receive offer offerings to stifle their vicious inclinations to be cruel. Be it Poseidon of the ocean or Ares, the architect of war, these individuals are often overemphasized characteristic of man's most beautiful behaviors or greatest of fears. But they were constructed by philosophical thought. Their culture would recognize a new God or the possibility of a God and thus give a name to that identity. So they indeed were very religious. And Paul continues, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. What's fascinating here? By this account, Paul is not showing frustration after seeing such an altar. He's not, he is not bothered by what he has seen. He's not insulting about it, but instead when he sees this unnamed altar, he sees an opportunity to take something they've built in ignorance and use it to the glory of God. The altar that someone attributed to the gods we've yet to know, Paul uses it to share how we are no longer ignorant, that we are no longer distant. The God who made heaven and earth does not reside in temples or in clouds waiting to receive offerings. He's here so that we may know him. Paul takes an empty, unnamed altar and uses what they know to the benefit of the gospel. And to this day, if there are still those who are practicing like this and behaving like this, that means there are opportunities for us to recognize these are the altars we find. For a moment, I want us to change the circumstances. Instead of finding an altar or an unnamed altar to an unknown God that we fill in the blank, let's change the scenario. What if God sent someone to build that altar? What if Paul 
or before Paul came, someone prepared a place that this moment was orchestrated by the hand of Yahweh himself. That God himself was unknown, or said a different way, was not yet understood. But out of obedience, they built this altar to the God they did not know because something was going to happen there. Because while I can't speak to the altar in Acts 17, this is exactly what we find in Genesis 12. For those who have your Bibles, we're starting in verse 1. In Genesis 12, the story of Abram begins. And it reads, verse 1, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and, I will, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and he who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Verse 4, so Abram went. We can stop right there. God says, go, and Abram moves. Before this, the most important thing that has just happened was Babel, and now we get a genealogy. There we meet Terah. He is the father of Abram. And as we read, we find out they're on their way to Canaan. That should seem familiar. In fact, Israel will spend 40 years in the wilderness waiting to get to this place. This is what we often refer to as the promised land. And so, if this is the eventual promised land, we find it earlier on in Genesis. In chapter 11, verse 31, it reads, But when they came to Haran, they settled there. They were on their way to something of value and came short because they settled for Haran. And while that's not my sermon today, I at least want us to recognize something. That we're talking about a God who comes to Abram and says, go, leave your country you settled in, your father's house, your kindred or your family. And Abram's response is not a question, but an action. Remember that. Verse 4 continues, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was about 75 years old when he departed for Haran, or from Haran. For a moment, I want to tell you a little bit more about the work my wife and I do. Last year, we partnered with our missionaries in Spain. These individuals, Kent and Jody Brown, are fantastic. I want to say everything kind about these people, but they're crazy. Because they found something in Spain that no one can explain. There is a trail called the Camino de Santiago. This trail is called the Way of James. James being the apostle that we see beheaded in the book of Acts. This trail has been in existence since even back then. People now from all over the world come to walk this trail. It's riddled with cathedrals, Christian imagery. People just have all these conversations. In fact, it's by the thousands people will start on the beginning of the trail. And for 30-something days, you will walk. You will not run. I can guarantee you, if you have a fraction of your life on your back, it is tough. Your day one is up a mountain. If you've never climbed a mountain, it's incredibly difficult. I know that because we did it last year to partner with them. We're taking interns on it next year, and my feet hurt thinking about it. <laughs> There is such an opportunity for evangelical ministry because as you walk for 30 days, you begin building relationships. With individuals, the average age is about 55 and older. The reason being is because most people take on the trail in retirement. They have plenty of time, they have a little bit of a nest egg, and so they go to this place where they have a nice encounter and they get to enjoy their religious experience as well. However, for people my age and younger, they have deconstructed their faith. They no longer believe in God. They are only there for health benefits. That said, 30-something days, six to eight hours a day, you and I are walking towards the same direction. And now you become a captive to the gospel because I get to conversate with you for these times. And what are you going to do? Run away? You can't run. Your feet hurt too much. I promise you. 
I was 30 years old when I took on this trail. I had a fraction of what Abram had. And not two weeks in, not two days in, not even barely two hours in, I was having some serious introspective thoughts, questions that I really should have had prior to stepping on this trail. I mean, you begin saying certain things to yourself like, hey, you've never really even walked for a few hours before. I don't think you ever climbed a mountain. You never did go to the gym. What are you doing? It's only day one, two hours in of 35 days, and your first rest day is not for another two weeks. If I promise you, if you've never prayed prayers like, God, if I could just mount on eagles and soar, you're hoping that verse was literal and that someone can experience that right then and there because it is tough. And Abram is 75 years old when he packs his life up and goes. He will be immortalized in our favorite children's song because of this. But ultimately, I can feel barely a fraction of that pain, and I understand. And it says in verse 5, And Abram took Sarai, his wife, Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through to the land, the place called Shechem, to the Oak of Morah, and at this time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. And so Abram built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. I want to make sure that we understand what happened here. So for a moment, I want these words to resonate. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Abram has uprooted his life. He's taken his wife, his nephew, his house, and his dog, his whole aspect of living, his possessions, everything, new people. Because a mysterious voice showed up one day and said, it's time to go. So he uproots everything. And you would think that God's taking him to the promised land. That's where they were going. We cannot forget that. So of course it makes sense that he's taken to Canaan. However, they settled for Haran. And it would make sense that God is finishing the story that was started a chapter prior, but that's not what happens. It says at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. So when they got to the place they were initially going, someone's already there. I have no misconception that God is not greater than any situation, but to take this land would be a battle, and this battle is not Abram's. What is a blessing in the season to come is a burden in this one. Said another way, what's going to be a blessing to Israel would be a burden to Abram. What Abram is told, what will be a blessing to your children would be a burden for you to fight for now. And even if you'd like to take something away personal from today, what could be a blessing for your children may be a burden for you to fight for right now. And so God appears and says, do you remember how I will make you a great nation? Verse 7, to your offspring, I will give this land. And Abram responds, not with words, but once again with action. But this time, it's not for his benefit, but for the people that are coming after him. The God who's taking me somewhere I do not know has told me, that this place will be yours someday. So when you get here, I want you to remember. It says he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to them, to him. Remember, Abram does not know Jehovah Jireh. He does not know about Isaac and Ishmael. He has not seen God provide a lamb in the thicket moments before his son's death. He's not received the blessing of Melchizedek. He's not yet been taken outside to see the stars and said, just as numerous as they are, so too will be your offspring. 
Abram is building an altar to a God who has only spoken, not proven himself, not provided a name. At this point, he could be all talk because he has not made himself known. And can you see it? Hidden in plain sight, the invisible thread. An altar to an unknown God. But the next time, the intended audience sees it. The people who the altar is for will use it to say even before Abram knew, God did. Hear this. One man's altar was someone else's promise. The idea that when they get there, the relational equity, the vast depths of how God keeps his covenants, his commitments... The God of the garden will be revealed. And so before Abram even knew that God, he built an altar to the one who had appeared to him. And that's the same language Paul uses, that this unknown God has now made himself known. He's not in temples. He's not in one of your statues. Paul, a student of the scrolls, looks at an unmarked altar and can see the story unfolding. There he shares, God has since made himself known, his name known. The same God that appeared then has appeared again and appears still. And this brings us back to the beginning of discerning the altars we find and the altars we leave behind. It's the philosophy of our missions department that missions does not start across the world, but across the street and out your front door. And so now, if that's the case, it's just a matter of recognizing what season you're in. Are you in a place where there's an altar built to an unknown God and it's waiting to be filled in by the name Jesus? Are you in a place where there's something that has power or dominion over an area and now you're an ambassador for rebellion and revelation? That they need someone to say, I know the God of Abram, Abraham, Isaac, Israel, Joseph, Moses, jo Joshua, Elijah, Elisha, David, Isaac, and Jeremiah. And all of them point to the same name, and that is Jesus. Does it look like you stepping in front of an altar, whatever that may look like, and you making the decision and with this thing, this idol, this distraction and saying this altar, whether it was made by God or not, will be used for the glory of God? Or are you called to move? Go. Blind obedience to build an altar for someone else's promised land. That when they arrive... That name has since been filled in. And they have a cornerstone, a touch point, a reminder that when they get there, he's been working long before they ever arrived. In the place you are right now, are you surrounded and provoked, or are you needing to be a submissive pioneer? We must recognize the season we're in, the opportunity that's being given to us, that there's an altar or do we need to build an altar that will eventually be used for his glory? For my note takers, I have a few things that I want us to recognize and a few questions to ask of our season. Number one, examine your surroundings. It says in Acts 17 verse 16 that his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Notice that the spirit wasn't immediately enraged, confused, frustrated, or provoked until he was looking at his city. Paul shows a great deal of discernment in the book of Acts, but it's interesting that the way Luke writes this, that as he was looking at the city of idols, his spirit felt provoked. But it's difficult to engage when you're not present where you are. A study a few years ago confirmed one of our greatest fears. In fact, do you know why we require sounds and shows and social media and such? It's not because we can't stand to be alone with our thoughts. It's not because we're afraid of the quiet. I mean this, the answer will blow your mind. People hate to be bored. 
profound, I know, truly, but people hate to be bored. In sincerity, people can't stand that sensation. Why sit in line quietly at McDonald's when I can enjoy a meal of social media posts, respond to texts, check my email, and maybe even catch a Pokemon? We put things in front of us or around us because our culture hates quiet. It hates waiting. It hates patience and it hates silence. That's why some of our most developed and higher populated cities, we can find people up at all hours eating and drinking and working and socializing. There's just too much to do. And if I only get about 70 years to gorge myself, and it, on my indulgences, but I need to spend the first 20 or one of it legally sober and educating myself, I only get about 50 to 60 years to really get it all in. And this is not a new phenomenon by any means. The busyness has always been apparent. There's always been something to do or something to be done, but the nature of how we approach the busyness has now become an irritant to the soul. It's like sandpaper that wears you away till you're either too distracted to be present or too strung out on overindulgences or overworking or oversaturated by noise. The quiet feels detrimental to your schedule. And to be present where you are, where things are happening, it's too great a deal to ask for. And yet, we can tell what people need when we pay attention to the statues and the businesses and the chapels and the mosques and the temples that are being built in our area. It's the season we're in and altars are being built so much so less obvious. But if we're not examining our surroundings, if we're too distracted, we'll have to explain to those after why we let them be built in the first place. However, for Abram, it's less about his surroundings and more about his submission. Can God come to you in a way in which you've never known and you be willing to build an altar, a witness to the thing he's doing? Said another way. If God has not healed you from cancer or pneumonia or just the common cold, and so you do not know him as healer yet, will you build there an altar now? for the people who need to see it, that when, he, when you do overcome it, there'll be a place to start in their understanding. Remember, to Abram, he's building this. He's not, when he's building this, he's not seen God bring his offspring here. And even if Abram waited his whole life, he still would have never understood what that promise meant to its fullness. But Abram builds in faith. And so the question to ask your season when I look around, am I seeing a promise or am I being provoked? Number two, use what you're given. For Paul, he didn't have to build a new place of worship. He used an unnamed altar to point to a God or point to the God who's chosen not to be distant but present. And this thing in this city surrounded by other idols he uses this well-known altar to build an understanding for the people. But Abram didn't even have that much when he got to Canaan. When he arrives, it's inhabited by someone else. And so he isn't expecting anything other than God to lead him to where he's going. But God pauses the story and gives him a glimpse of his plans and Abram is not asked to build a tabernacle or anything extravagant. It doesn't say that he fetched the most pristine of resources available. It says he built an altar there. Ultimately, while we may be people of excellence, I know one of the greatest fears that stops momentum is what if what I make is not good enough? I believe wholeheartedly, whether it's someone else's work or your best attempt, it can be blessed so long as it's your burden that brought you to action. The question I ask, and if I can have the worship team join me, do I have something to work with or am I using my resources to build something? Number three, ask the right questions. 
it's difficult for me to identify Abram and then ignore his lack of inquiry. Abram didn't ask any questions. He responded. Paul didn't inquire about the idol. He used it to his advantage. But remember, this is not for the person who's currently uncomfortable or walking out your obedience. These points are to help us distinguish which season and which opportunity is in front of us right now. And that may look like taking time to ask clarifying questions. I know when talking of Paul and Abram, we have an understanding that these two men of faith needed little to start moving. But if we haven't even started looking at our situation through this lens, then it's important that we respond in the way God is wanting us to respond. So the question here to ask, does this situation require obedience or objection? For a moment, I want to give us an opportunity to respond. While I haven't been a teacher long enough, I always understand one thing. I don't know uh, the community I'm stepping into, and nor, I don't, nor do I know what the condition of every individual is. So I'd like to make a few invitations. And the first being, if you do not know the God who has made himself known, we would love to introduce you. However, if you've never even examined the opportunity that's been in front of you, if you've never yielded to the prompting of the Spirit that looks at your surroundings and provoked something within you, or alternatively just told you, you cannot stay here, then we want to teach you and pray with you to hear the voice so that when it comes, you know what you're supposed to do. Or in the situation for those who have been given the objection or the observance, the people that understand I need to be submissive, I just do not know how. I also believe in a God who gives guidance. And we'd like to invite you that we may pray for you, my wife and I, for a few minutes, for a few moments. We have set this time aside for you and we've all come together today. And if you love prayer, even for any other reason, we'd love to minister with you that way. Is that okay? Thank you. 
amazing God. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come on up here, gentlemen. We're going to go ahead and pray. We thank you, Lord, that we see it. We we serve a risen Savior. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. At this time, we're gonna bless our missionaries. Amen. So, God is good. You serve a good God today. Amen. And once we give, once we give in our uh, in this offering, you're you're excused to go home. You don't put in it. Come up to the altars and pray. No, I'm just messing with you. Let's pray. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would bless. Lord, bless our missionaries. Lord, we thank you for their heart. Their heart, Lord, to reach. To reach, Lord, the outer, the the people groups, Lord, that some of us might not even ever have heard about, know about. Lord, bless them, Lord. Give them wisdom, Lord above and beyond, Lord, what they've ever had before. Lord, and as they, they create this curriculum, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, Lord, that you give them insight like they've never had before. Father, bless them, Lord, as they write this. Lord, because it's going to go out throughout the world and it's going to impact every continent, Lord, and we thank you for that. Lord, we praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And if you make a check, just make it out to um, M46, and the church is going to write them one check. So thank you, Lord.